The Bible says faith comes by hearing. So how can people believe unless they hear? So how can my message be how to evangelize without preaching the gospel? Is it a curious title? You know, this title drives evangelists mad because evangelists always want to preach. And thank God for evangelists. Somebody say, thank God for evangelists. Amen. Amen. But you know, there are other ministry gifts and not every one of us is an evangelist. And not everyone has to be an evangelist. Seriously. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> My story of evangelism is such a story of failure. I have such a heart to share the gospel. But as a young Christian, I had so much zeal, but I had no skill. That's dangerous. I wanted to, but I couldn't. So I used to preach to the bed and to the chair. And they, they would listen. But it was difficult to preach to people. Because I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid, you know, you take things personally. They reject God, not you. Right? We are worried that they go to hell five minutes after we preach and they don't accept the God. God. So we think it's our responsibility. But evangelism is a d divine work with human cooperation. It's a divine work. How were you saved? How were you saved? Somebody preached to you? You were convicted by the Holy Spirit? Do you understand my English? No response? How were you saved? Your parents dragged you to church? You were drunk and somebody else dragged you to church? You didn't know how did I get here? <laughs> Suddenly you got sober because God touched you? I had a Canadian friend. He's, actually, he was, he's a red Indian. He looks like Winnie too. Only the scary version. He was in prison. Several times drug user, and he was full on, on drugs. He was walking around the streets of Vancouver in Canada, and then these two ladies started to pray for him. He broke down, cried like a baby, and he became a believer. Then they took him to the drop-in center. He slept for three days after that. And God started to cleanse this man and change him just because somebody prayed. They didn't preach. Oh, now I'm already giving away my points here. How to evangelize without preaching the gospel? I want to give you three ways to evangelize without preaching the gospel. How many of you have a desire to preach, but you somehow you are afraid or you don't think you can do it? It's difficult. Now, you, I'm sure you want to have a second message that says how to evangelize with preaching the gospel, right? I'm sure you want to know that. Now is the first part, how to evangelize without preaching the gospel. Because sometimes you cannot preach because people don't want to hear or you're in a country where it's illegal to preach the gospel. You know, there are such, such countries. You know, in Bulgaria, like in, like in the other countries you guys come from, it's not illegal to be a Christian or to preach the gospel. Did you know that 70% of Christians in the world are persecuted? You and I are not in a country with persecution. Oh, my colleague rejected me because I'm a Christian. That's not persecution. <laughs> persecution is physical violence. It's discrimination. You know, Bulgaria under communism, there were several things you couldn't bring into the country. Drugs, weapons, Bible. pornography, and Bibles. All on the same list. <laughs> Dangerous stuff. Because the communists knew the power of religion. That's why they wanted to remove it. When uh, Bulgaria was, um, when, the, when the Ottoman Turks tried to convert Bulgaria by force to Islam for 500 years, chopping off people's heads, raping women, grabbing young boys, bringing them back to Turkey, indoctrinate them, send them back to convert their own people. Brutal history. But the Bulgarians wouldn't bow their knee to that kind of a thing. It's the same stuff that ISIS is doing in Syria and Iraq that has been happening on these lands. But the Christians in Bulgaria have stood by their faith. Very few converted to Islam under force. That's not a true conversion anyway. People brag that Islam is the fastest growing religion. That's because they have no re freedom to choose. And they have lots of kids. That's a lie when they think, oh, Islam is such a great religion because it's growing so fast. It's a, total, it's a total fake thing. Anyway, we are not here to speak about Islam or against Islam. We are here to speak about Jesus Christ. Because He is the Savior and He wants all men to be saved. Let's, you know, 1 Timothy 2, 4, God wants all men to be saved. That includes all your family members. That includes all your druggy friends, if you have any. That includes all your drunk uncles and your divorced aunts. God wants to save everybody because He loves people. 
but how can you evangelize them? That's the question. And as a young believer, I was so under pressure because I always felt I must evangelize every, anybody on the plane next to me, on the train, on the bus. I need to necessarily evangelize them now because when they get off the bus, a car may hit them, they will then go to hell. It's my fault. <laughs> I was so under pressure that I was never natural. At Bible school, they sent us out two by two. I was with a big uh, lady from Bermuda. We were walking down the streets and I was so afraid to speak to people about God. I was on fire in the meeting. I was praying and I had a heart, but I just couldn't speak. I was a terrible speaker, a terrible preacher. If you think I'm bad now, thank God you didn't hear me 15 years ago. <laughs> but despite my inability and my fear and my problems, I was trying to find a way of how to articulate what is in my heart. And that's what we need to be able to do. That's the second message, how to preach how to evangelize with preaching the gospel. But how can we evangelize without preaching the gospel? And not just because we don't know how or we are afraid, but because sometimes people don't want to listen. Isn't that true? You know, uh, there's a famous pastor in Sweden. He was evangelizing on the street. A Swedish man took out his wallet and said, This is my God. <laughs> and that little boy didn't know what to say to him. How would you answer that man? You know? People have all kinds of gods. And we have to deal with this kind of stuff. We have to find ways of how to reach out to people. Point number one, how to evangelize without preaching the gospel. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, good works. Good works. Tell your neighbor good works. What's a good work? How to evangelize without preaching the gospel. Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 16. This is what we want to do this week in this beautiful little town here where hardly anything is ever happening. We have two orphanages here. We have lots of retired people. We have lots of invalid people. Most young people have left because there is not enough work. This used to be a great town with industry and over 5,000 people lived here. Of course, this is not comparable to Manchester, for example. But you know, if 100 young people go to Manchester, nobody will notice. But if 100 young people come here, everybody will notice. So we are a little bit exposed here, but that's good. Yes. Tell your neighbor, just shape up in the morning, do your hair, you know, brush your teeth, look good. Tomorrow the TV is coming to film you doing some social work here. Bring out your best clothes, good. How to evangelize without preaching the gospel, number one, good works. You know, there was a great, famous monk, Francis of Assisi. A heck of a charismatic guy, by the way. Total, lived in total poverty just to... He said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. <laughs> preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. You can do good works for people to see. Matthew 5, verse 16. Listen to this. Let your light shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You know the song? This week you must let your light shine. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Number one, good works. You can do good works that speak of God without you speaking with words. Amen? How to evangelize without preaching the gospel? Live a good life. Be an example. You know, when we were 16 or 14, can't remember, we would sit around in the forest and then we were about you know, 15 guys in a circle, and the first guys pull out cigarettes. And in those days, it was such a terrible sin to even smoke a cigarette. Now the 12-year-old smoked dope already. But in those days, whoa, that was such a terrible thing. So we were sitting in a, in a circle, and the first guy started to smoke. <coughs> you know, they can't smoke when they're young. And, and they passed the cigarettes around. I was the last one. And I said, no, thank you, don't smoke. And the guy next, uh, no, I was the second last one, excuse me. The, the, the last guy said, Wow, so cool. I'm not going to smoke too. I'm not going to smoke either. So I gave, and you know, I don't even know why I did it. It was just, you know, later I started to smoke, unfortunately. But in those days, somebody was different, and it helped that guy not to follow the crowd. Because all these other guys were probably sorry that they followed the bad example, but that guy had a chance to follow the good example. Tell your neighbor, be a good example. 
young girls who refuse to sleep around are good examples to those girls who look for the wrong things in men and then mess up their whole future. You, you can be a good example. You don't have a boyfriend? Something is wrong with you. I said, no, something is right with me. Something is wrong with you. Why would you give away your most precious thing to a guy who wants to also only to use you and then throw you away? Why do you want to do that? Ask a clever question. Amen? Be an example. Do good works. What kind of good works? Help old ladies across the street? For sure. I was driving with the bus the other day. An old lady fell over. You stop and you make sure they are well. If they need a hospital, drive them to the hospital. Amen? Good works. Let your light shine before men. This conference is called Beyond the Walls. Because churches have been hiding behind the walls. Amen? But it is important what is going on within the walls because it will determine what you can do beyond the walls. Because you cannot do God's work without God's empowering. That was my problem. I had a desire, but I had not got, I didn't have enough skill. And it's okay to learn skill. Amen? It's okay. God wants to work in you before He wants to work through you. He must shape the man or the woman in order to make you the vessel, become the vessel that He wants you to become in order for you to do what He wants you to do. Amen? Are you writing that all down? Good. Well done. God wants to shape us and form us so we can let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. But this, the verse is not finished there. Chapter 6, you notice in Matthew chapter 6, it's about not showing off your re religiosity in front of men. Remember? Don't make a show with your religion. In what way then must you let your light shine before men? Well, read the verse. What did Jesus say? So that... People, when they see your good works, will do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Christians must not serve for their own glory, but for the glory of God. And if you do what you do with a pure motive, people will glorify God, not you. You know, even Bill Gates and, and all these other guys, other Bills and Wills, they, want, they do all kinds of good works. Thank God it's making a difference, but they do it for their own glory. You and I are called to glorify God, not ourselves. Let your light shine in, in, before men in such a way that they may see your good works. It's okay for people to see your good works. But you have to have pure motives in order for them to glorify God. Did you notice when Jesus performed miracles, people were worshipping God, not Jesus? That's remarkable. When they thought Paul and Barnabas were Zeus and Hermes, the Greek gods, Paul said, no, 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 it's God, it's not us. Right? So sometimes people can be confused, especially in a religious environment. You have to be clear in your heart that what you do for God is for God's glory. Amen? You will receive glory and honor from God. You don't seek it from men. You want to let your light shine so that you can point people to God. And so much in Christianity today is about my church, our ministry, you know. And we glorify a ministry, a church, but we want to glorify God. You know, the church is a family for our benefit, right? But the church is also God's instruments for their benefit. So we need to keep two things in mind. Church is not our possession. Jesus is the head of the church. He redeemed the church. So we are His family, His children, but also His servants. Amen? We are sons of God, but we are also servants of the Most High. We want to use our lives to do good works. Amen? How to evangelize without preaching the gospel? Number one, good works. Tell your neighbor, do good works. You know, sometimes we are a little bit embarrassed to do good works in public. And we should, do, uh, we should give with our right hand without the left hand knowing. Now, that's physically impossible, right? That's exactly why Jesus used it, because it's an exaggeration to bring home a point. It was a preaching technique. Like in England, you say, I could eat the horse when you're very hungry. Really? No, you exaggerate for effect, right? That's exactly what Jesus did. It's physically impossible to do something with your right hand without your left hand being aware of it. But Jesus wants us to have such pure motives, that whatever we do, we do for God's glory. And people will be drawn to God. 
People say, wow, what lovely people. And then they will say, what a great God they serve. I also want to believe in that God. You can lead people by a good example to believe in the, in the God you believe in. Not by convincing them to come to church and you're such a, a, a stubborn donkey and you keep inviting them, you don't let them sleep. And in the end, they come just to shut you up. Amen? You've given them so many invitations. They say, oh, let me just go once so he's not going to give me any more. We don't want to force people to church. We want people to come to church because they want to come. But people need help. We remember in, 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 in our hometown in Switzerland, we, we, we had this stable church. You had church meetings in, in the stable where the horses used to be. Some of you have seen the place, old and scruffy, but powerful inside. And there was a, there was a man, he was an outcast in our village. And he came and he sat in the back next to my mother. And that testimony impressed me. He came for the first time, you know, and we stand up, we lift our hands, we shout, we sing, we go full on, you know. And he's like, what's this, you know. And my mother sat next to him. And you know what he said? He said, you know what? If you would have stood up like all the others, I would have walked out. Because he felt out of place. But my mother sat next to him and just kind of associated with him. You get the point? We have to help people. Build bridges, associate with the humble, associate with the lonely, and try to win people. Amen? There's all kinds of ways you can let your light shine. There's all kinds of ways. There is no limit to what you can do. Amen? So if you can't speak, if you can't preach like Reinhard Bonnke, don't worry about it. You can do good works. Ask your neighbor, can you do good works? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then go ahead. You can do good things. You can be an example at school. Even at EYC, you can be an example of punctuality, of cleanliness, of decency to others among us. Amen? Be an example. Be a good example. Do some good works that glorify God. Amen? Second point. By the way, for the boys, excuse the pink lids. But this is really good mineral water. And if you're embarrassed as, as boys to walk around with a pink bottle, uh, buy another one. It's, it's very cheap. Yet you already did that. Good. Uh, but try to refill. Oh, so that's not the mic. That's the mic. Try to refill the bottles. Don't just use bottle after bottle because we have limited supply. The water is very drinkable. There is even the, we have our own mineral water in this town. So um, anyway, water is life, right? So is the Holy Spirit. How can you evangelize without preaching the gospel? Number one, good works. Number two, supernatural power. People don't always want to listen to you, but they can't stop you praying for them. Come on. You can pray for people even if they don't want to listen. And many times you need to pray a lot before you can even speak to them. Supernatural power. If people get healed by your prayers, guess whom they will call to, to talk to them? You. If they know you. You pray for them. You know, people don't always like to be preached at. People, they feel uncomfortable sometimes when you ask difficult questions. We still have to ask them, but at the right time, with the right preparation. Did you know that a farmer, how many of you have no clue about farming? You, come on, it's okay to admit that. Are we just writing the list because we'll send it to the farmer tomorrow to help him? No, no, I'm just joking. Boaz is a professional farmer, right? So he, he knows, Boaz, when the sower goes on, does he just go on any field and so, throw the seed there and go back and have a coffee? No. What does the farmer need to do with the land before he sows? Prepare the land. Take the weeds out because the weeds will kill the, the, the vegetables or the flowers, whatever you no, right? We understand that much about farming, right? Not much more, but that's enough. Anyway, take the bad stuff out. Clear the plow the land. The seed has to go into the ground. Otherwise, the birds will come and take it away. You need to prepare people in prayer before you evangelize them. But sometimes, even then, that's not enough. But you can pray for supernatural things to happen, and suddenly, something will change with them. Suddenly, this will open their hearts to hear the gospel. Amen? We know so many stories in Scripture how the supernatural power of God changed everything. They wanted to stop the apostles from preaching. But there was a layman at the, at, at the central place for the Jewish people. The temple was the center of the universe. And God put, one, God put one layman there. 
And he looked at them begging for money. And because they were pastors, they didn't have any. <laughs> Silver and gold I don't have. I'm not talking about the American prosperity pastors. I'm talking about real pastors here. Um, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What is that? Supernatural power. This missionary, he went to some, you know, jungle, islandy place. And the witch doctors, they could lift people up into the five meters into the sky with witchcraft. You know, beam me up, Scotty. Not like Star Trek, real stuff. And they asked the missionary, can your God also do this? He says, no, he can't do that, but let me show you what he can do. In the name of Jesus, I break that power. And the guy <laughs> fell on the ground. So he has like a superior power. The magicians of Egypt could also make sticks, sticks into snakes. But the snakes of Moses ate up their snakes. Come on. There is power in the demonic, but there is nothing that compares to the power of our God. But you and I need to know how to move in that power because that's not an easy thing. God cannot trust anybody with power. You know, when I was young, we went to the, what you call that? The Jahrmarkt. The fair. Thank you. Not the fairy tale. The fair with all the joy rides. And there was this little booth where you can shoot the gun. I didn't know how to shoot the gun. So you're supposed to put the thing here, the, the shaft. What do you call it? Because when, it, when you shoot the gun, it, it, it hits back, right? So I couldn't see like this, so I put it in front of my face. <laughs> and then it hit. That's how ignorant I was. Telling him, oh, there's hope for me too. Good, then. The joke is on me. And I thought, oh, I did something wrong. <laughs> this is not how it's supposed to work. The, he, the, he, the thing hit me in the face. So when you don't know how to handle power, you need to learn how to handle power. Some, some of us learn the hard way. <laughs> it's very funny. You laugh about me. That's fine. Learn to handle power, but in order to handle the power, you need to be familiar with the presence. The power comes through the presence of God. We don't want power for the sake of power. We want power for the sake of serving. We need to serve that people will glorify God. There is so much witchcraft, there is so much demonic stuff going on, and they dress as Christians, but actually it's all demonic. And they deceive people instead of leading people to God. Worship is not about selling CDs, about becoming famous. Worship is about helping people finding God. And you know what? Even as leading worshipers, as musicians, we cannot bring you into the presence of God. That's a big doctrinal error that the worship team will lead us into the presence of God. That is impossible. You have access to the presence of God. Unless you move in your spirit, nothing that is happening here on stage will ever help you. Unless you want to serve God, unless you want to see God. Is that correct? You have access to God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You must enter the presence of God. Nobody can lead you. We can help you. We can call on God and, you know, create an atmosphere. But unless we all seek God, this is not going to happen. Amen? So we all want you to be seekers of God. We want you to be servants of men. Amen? We want you to be lovers of God. Amen? To love God, to serve men, to experience His presence and His power. Supernatural power. How can you evangelize without preaching the gospel? With supernatural power. Amen? Last point, divine love. Amen? Ring a bell. John 13. How will the world see that we are the disciples of Christ? There was a question. How can the world recognize us that we are disciples of Christ? That we hate each other, we gossip about each other? You know, one man came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I'm leaving the church. It's full of hypocrites here. And the pastor said, you know, I know. But it's better to spend a few years on earth with hypocrites than eternity in hell with them. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get that? Why don't you try to help people? Instead of criticizing them, judging them. You know, hypocrites are often not necessarily bad people. They may just be people full of problems. And if you can help them, you can do a good work. Amen? Maybe people are hurt. Maybe people are afraid to, to, to admit weakness. That's why they pretend something they are not. When we become insecure, we also maybe pretend a little bit more than what we are. No? Okay, you don't know what I'm talking about. People are sometimes very insecure. You need to help them by accepting them, by loving them. 
Love does not have any evil intention. Love seeks to serve. Love seeks to up uphold, upbuild others. Never mind their weakness. You can help them. Not to compromise. Oh, it's okay to sleep around, to smoke some drugs. God loves. No, no, no. We're not talking about legalizing sin. But we, we, are not, we are speaking about not being judgmental. Not being hard and pushing people down. But showing them the right way. Paul said, let me show you a higher way. Yes, John 13, 1 Corinthians 13, fits perfectly well. Jesus would wash the feet of the disciple and say, by the love among you, people will know that. We, you know, this is what the people can see this week. The way we treat each other. The friendliness, the happiness, the joy. That's what they want to see. Not young people who are just kind of grumpy and complaining, drink beer, throw the bottle on the floor. Some of us were like that too. God has forgiven us sins. Amen. If you've never been a sinner, thank God. It's much better like that. You know, I wish I, I, would, I would hear what you are hearing when I was your age. I wish. But no matter how old you are, how young you are, now is the time to seek God. Now is the time to do good works. Now is the time to encounter the supernatural power of God. Now is the time to experience the love of God that first heals you and then releases you. There is nothing more powerful than the love of God. Let me show you a scripture in... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, we... Um, so how many of you girls like perfume? It's okay to admit that, fine. We don't want to be a bunch of smelly folks. No, it's okay to wear deodorant. Actually, it's compulsory. And uh, it's okay to wear perfume. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, as students, we, we were quite tight financially, but one day I was so proud I bought my wife a beautiful, expensive perfume. Hallelujah. I didn't, I didn't try it. It, was, it, was, it says Bulgari. There's a Bulgarian who went to Italy and became famous with Bulgari. You know, Bulgaria is the biggest rose oil producer in the world. The highest quality rose oil, which is the foundation for any good perfume. It comes from this country, even this town. You'll hear more about it this afternoon. Um, so I bought this beautiful perfume for my wife, and then she put it on. <laughs> and when I came close, she said, wait a minute. That's the same like my mother's. <laughs> and uh, then I, I like to think about my mother, but not when I'm close to my wife. In, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Now I'm close to my wife, and then I think, oh, my mother. <laughs> so it, it was a totally wrong perfume that I bought. Anyway, before you spend money, be smart. Amen? The joke's on me. It's okay. Uh, perfume is something good, it's something nice. Well, if they don't overdo it. How many of you have you been in a room with ordinary people and suddenly that lady full of perfume walks in? You know that story? And I just say, that's a bit overdone. Or you say, hmm, that's nice. All these sweaty, smelly men around me, another lady with the perfume comes in, you know? Let me tell you, you in the spirit should be a person with perfume. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Are you ready? Yes. Tell your neighbor you need spiritual perfume. Hey? Don't be a smelly guy. Have a spiritual perfume. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Excuse me, but this is really true. Where do the flies gather? Oh, you city guys, you don't know. Where do flies gather? What brown substance attracts flies? It's a substance released through the back door of animals and humans. You understand what I'm saying? Flies are attracted to a certain smell. That's why you should never allow flies to land on your food. Because what you cannot see with your natural eye, even with those fancy glasses, is what a, a fly does on your food. Shall I tell you? This will change your life. Ready? <laughs> the fly has been on the... Favorite holy place there where the fly goes. Brown. <laughs> it's full of it. It lands on your food. It vomits on your food. No, seriously. You all have YouTube. You can do the fact finding. It makes a little kashichka. Uh, what, what do the children, the children eat? And brai. What's that? What you feed to the little babies. Porridge. Thank you. Porridge. Sucks it up. And when it leaves the fly, it, yeah, it leaves with a bang, so to speak. 
That's what a fly does on your food. So tell your neighbor, never allow a fly to mess with your food ever again. Sorry, I just ruined your appetite. This was a health and safety announcement. In the spiritual, demons are attracted to sin and to impurity. The Holy Spirit is attracted to purity. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Notice the word always. Jesus was triumphant even in death. Even in rejection. That's amazing. No matter what you do, if you are in Christ, if you are led by God, it's always a victory. Amen? 1999, Champions League final. Sorry that I have to use Man United as a good example. Forgive me, but that's how it was. I don't want to mention Liverpool 2005. That's another story. <laughs> Tell your neighbor you never walk alone. Manchester United was losing 1-0 against Bayern Munich. Remember? 1999. Were you born then? Yeah? You were small? How old were you? What, what year? You were born in 1999. So when this beautiful man was born, Bayern Munich and Man United were playing the Champions League final, the biggest trophy. Where's Stilian? He's a Man United fan there. Don't mess with him. He's a big guy. Um, Pastor Tony will have a word with him afterwards. Um, they were losing 1-0, and it was the 90th minute. Correct? And Bayern Munich was leading 1-0. They were thinking, hey, we've won. We're going to lift up the trophy. We are champions of Europe. You know, great. Man United got three minutes extra time, and they scored two goals and win. They were losing for 90 minutes, and then they won it in three. If your life feels like a failure and a defeat, it's not over until the referee blows the whistle. You fight until the end and you can still win. Come on. You know, we have done a lot for this town and we have very little, very little fruit. It's tough. It's tough. And people reject you and people don't, you know. But we cannot allow ourselves to become hardened or upset. We have to continue to fight until victory. In Christ, we will have the victory. He always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us. What? The sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. What is it? A sweet aroma. A perfume. Amen? Not a smelly old guy, but a beautiful smell in the Spirit. Angels, the Holy Spirit is attracted to that. The Holy Spirit dwells among those, and the angels of the Lord dwell among those who fear God. Yes. Amen? To fear God is to abstain from evil. Yes. Right? Yes. The Holy Spirit is attracted, and you are spreading a fragrance. You may not be able to evangelize somebody by words this week. Maybe you are. And it's, it's legal. Nobody will lock you up for it. But to, this week, you can evangelize without preaching the gospel by doing good works, by praying for people. And by showing divine love in your life and towards others. Go to Ephesians 5. Paul encourages us to be imitators of God. You know, young people always need examples. They need heroes. It's true. Young people need role models. Are you, do you like Ronaldo or Messi? Messi. You know? That was just a rhetorical question. <laughs> th thanks for your answer. So now we have two camps. Some boys like Messi, some like Ronaldo. By the way, Messi's cousin is here somewhere. Where is he? Where, where are you? German. Yeah, there he is. Stand up. Yeah, you're, you're Messi's cousin. You're from Argentina. Look, he looks almost like him. I call him Messi. Yeah, it's true. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. It's not true. I call him Messi. His name is David. Anyway, they found the look, Messi's look like in Iran. Have you seen it on Facebook? Yeah. It looks exactly like Messi in Iran. Anyway, people need heroes. They need somebody to look, look up to. Yes? Yeah. The Bible says we as Christians must be imitators of God. Now, when you play football, you can try to imitate Messi. That's fine. 
Absolutely fine. It's hard. <laughs> you know, he's so small, you can hardly see him. But all the defenders get dizzy. Where is he now? You know, try to imitate him. You know, when I was young, I was a goalkeeper. I want to be like Peter Shilton. You probably don't know him. You know him? Oh, good. I, ha I had a Peter Shilton England t-shirt with, with pads even on here. And I thought, oh, I want to be like Peter Shilton. It was England's good goalkeeper, one of the few they ever had. <laughs> and then I heard the best goalkeeper England ever had was Gordon Banks. That was in, in the 60s. I was not born then either. Because I had a struggle with my name when I was young. I grew up in Switzerland and nobody has ever heard of my, of my name, Gordon. And in the Swiss pronounce it in a very silly way, Gordon. <laughs> God forgive the Swiss, but... There was, at one stage, I was upset with my parents for giving me such a stupid name. No, seriously. Hello, I'm Stephen, or any average name. And I said, I'm Gordon. What? <laughs> Gordon, what? Gordon, and then I get so angry and I think, like, why did they give me this name? <laughs> Have you got this problem about your name? No? Georgie, why? Hey, Georgie is the, the, the Bulgarian dragon slayer. He's Saint George. Not him, but somebody else <laughs> in history. So I said to my mother, why didn't you call me Bruce? Bruce, Bruce Lee, I've got only the Lee, I don't have the Bruce. And then my mother says, ah, let me tell you a story. One man went to Australia. You know, in Australia, everybody's called either Wayne or Bruce. Have you been to Australia? So this lady met five, meets five men, and the first, how was your name? Wayne. What's your name? Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. And the last was called Bruce. He said, you know what, to keep things simple, let's call you also Wayne. So my mother was explaining, it's good to have a different type of a name. So I started to accept my name, and then I heard about Gordon Banks, and I want to become a goalkeeper. My career was very short and unsuccessful, but at least as a child, you want a dream. These are our, this is part of finding our identity, right? You identify with your parents, and then you find your football heroes, your music heroes, your, your Hollywood actors, and there are good ones and bad ones. In Hollywood, there are more bad examples than good examples. Amen? Come on. Be careful whom you follow. Be careful who is your example. Be very careful who becomes your idol. But look what the Bible says. Be imitators of God as beloved children. And what do you do as imitators of God? You walk in love. That's a natural way to be imitating God, to love. Well, how did Jesus live? He loved people. He laid down his life because he loved people. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. That's the ultimate test of love. That statue that you see outside, he was the, the, the revolutionary leader in this region. And this building is named after him. You will hear more about him this, this evening. He laid down his life for his fellow men. He did not betray his fellow revolutionaries, even when they burnt him. He would not betray. Judas did not love because he betrayed. Uh, what's his name? Peter did not betray Christ. He denied Christ. And he felt so sorry about it. And he changed. There is a difference between you having a weakness and sometimes you're a little bit shy about your Christianity. I was loved at at school for being a Christian. Fair enough. Get over it. Move on. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, our speaker last night was a brilliant example when they asked the Egyptian family, do you hate the people who murdered your relatives? He said, when a blind man falls on me and hurts me, first I get a little bit upset, but then I realized he's blind. What a powerful example was that. That touched me last night, man. That was very powerful. So people are doing things out of ignorance. It's okay. Love them. Help them. Be beyond it. All these bad people, they don't want to hear the gospel. I'm not going to preach to them anymore. We did so much for them. Pfft, let's just go shake off the dust of your feet. That's what Jesus said. No, you can't live in hatred and anger and frustration. You, you stay on your mission field until your mission is complete. Oh, nobody likes me at school. They all think I'm a little bit weird. No, they are the weird ones. Amen? 
You're not weird. Tell your neighbor, you're not weird. Okay, say, tell your neighbor, maybe not, not fully sure about you, but never. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, another health and safety announcement. Drink enough water. I'm just trying to give you a good example. Be imitators of God. Walk in love as other Christians do. No, as Christ. Who is your example? Christ. Can other Christians be an example to you? For sure. But you are not called to become like other Christians. You are called to become like Christ. Oh, so many Christians have done me well. Talk, tell, talk to me about it. Of course you'll suffer. When I was a, a young guy, before I was converted, I sat in a lovely Swiss Pentecostal church meeting. I sat in the middle of the room. Black clothes, long hair, cowboy boots, smell of smoke, and the, you know? And all these nicely dressed Swiss people, you know? And uh, the pastor made a joke from the, from the platform. And I didn't understand it was a joke. He said, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you're going to ruin it. And I thought, oh, he must be speaking about me. <laughs> and I thought, all these Christians are just a perfect bunch of people. There's nothing wrong and I'm the sinner. And I had no problem admitting that because I knew I needed somebody to tell me how to get out of my sin. I needed nobody to tell me that I'm bad and I'm a sinner. I needed somebody to show me the way out. You know, sometimes evangelists, they want to convince people how bad and sinful they are. And their logic is to show them that they really need Christ. Don't condemn people when you preach to them. You know what that is like? A kiss with a bad breath. You don't have to kiss somebody to find out the illustration if you're not married. But even if you go close to people after the coffee break, you can feel the bad breath with even without kissing them. Right? But don't go around kissing people here, please. I'm trying to make a point. Something nice can turn into something horrible. We cannot preach from anger or frustration. We have to do everything we do because of love. And Christ is our example. He gave himself up as an offering, last bit of the verse, and the sacrifice to God as what? A fragrant aroma. A beautiful Bulgari perfume. Or whatever you like, Chanel. And I can't afford that, okay? Don't waste your money on expensive perfume that smells, you know, as good as a cheaper one. It's okay. Amen? I'm not trying to sell you perfume. I'm just trying to make an illustration. Be a fragrant aroma. Physically, definitely important. Take a shower. What did, what did Paul tell us last year, the, the year before? He was having a shower, you know, and suddenly one young man runs in, turns on the water, stands there for two seconds, or three, Paul, how many was it? And runs out. And Paul was thinking, what? Was, that's what you call a shower? Running, water out. No, take your time, okay? Ladies, you know how to take your time in the bathroom. Make sure physically you smell good and so on. But spiritually, spiritually, it's the way your attitude is, your, your, the way you treat people. When you do something wrong this week, it's okay. As long as you listen when you are corrected, it's okay. Nobody likes to be corrected. Let's be honest, right? How many of you like, oh, correct me, correct me, please. I like it. No. But sometimes we need to know where we are wrong in order to find out how we can do it right. So when, when, you, when, you, you know, when you are walking down the girls' corridor as a boy, and don't tell me, oh, don't you believe in gender choice? I feel like, a, no, 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 we don't believe in that. You know, you are a boy or you are a girl, and there is nothing in between. It's that simple. And God made you the way he wanted you. Oh, I always wish I was a girl. No. If you're a boy, you're a boy. If you're a girl, you're a girl. And there is nothing in between. This is crazy what's going on. Yes. They tell children, do you feel like a boy or a girl? Oh, maybe today I want to feel like a girl, tomorrow I can feel... And people get so confused. It's a very demonic thing, by the way. Yes. It's nothing to do with tolerance and openness. No, this is total nonsense. God made you for a purpose the way he made you. Yes. Pastor Kwame even explained to us why African people have the shape of nose they have. God made it by design. He can tell us later. God does everything right. You know where the white people come from. You know it? When Cain killed Abel, God asked him, where's your brother? And he became very pale. <laughs> <laughs> You've never read the Bible. 
That's where the white people come from. No, it's just a joke. When you do something wrong, you become very pale, right? Or you become red, you blush. God made you for a purpose. God made you for a desi- with a design. God put you in this place, in this life, for a purpose. Don't say, I wish I was born uh, in China. I wish I was born in Africa. I wish I was born in, in Switzerland. Don't, be, don't think about that kind of stuff. You are you, and you are the best you. Tell your neighbor, you are the best you. Tell your neighbor, there is no better me than me. Yeah. As a Christian, we should not feel weak and foolish and silly and, you know, we're just a bunch of idiots and we don't know nothing. And No, we know the truth. Amen. Amen? We have to be successful. We have to be skillful. We have to be leaders in our society. But not under pressure, not under compulsion, but naturally as you allow God to make you what he wants you to become. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. Where is the making? In the following. So follow, learn, grow. It's okay. Why do you go to school for so many years? To learn. You know, animals are born with instinct. They know what to do. They don't go to school. We are not animals. We are humans. We are created in the image and likeness of God. We are created humble in order to grow and to learn. It's naturally, if you watch the children here, They want to learn. You know, they see all the cables and the buttons and they want to touch because they're curious. Not because they're naughty. Intelligent children are curious children. It's the dumb children that don't want to know anything because they, you know. It's true. Intelligent children, don't tell them, you naughty child, you shouldn't do that. No, he's intelligent, he wants to know. My brother-in-law, my wife's brother, when he got a remote control car, he always unscrewed everything and opened the car. And of course, he destroyed the car, and the father, his father got very upset. But he was curious because he was very, he's very intelligent, and he wanted to know, how does this work? Yeah. Don't tell the child off for destroying the car when he's intelligent. He, he may become an engineer one day. So if you are curious, if you are eager, that is, there, there is a hunger in you to learn more. Amen? It's okay. Follow that. Grow. Learn. Become what God wants you to become. But in all of that, you can become a fragrant aroma before God. Amen? Good works, supernatural power, and divine love. Soon we're going to have a little break, and then my father will speak. But before we have lunch at 12.30, we will have a discussion group. We're going to divide you up in groups, according to language, obviously, which makes it easier as we had the previous EYCs. And I want you to discuss among, among one topic, and my father will give you another one. How can you express those three points, good work, supernatural power, divine love, in a more effective way? Help each other. Share from your experience, how do you express that? What do you do in order to be a good example at school? Are you a good student, a, a student? You look like one. You, you have good grades? Yeah. Do some people say, eh, the Streiber, what heißt that in English? Oh, he's just so clever and he always wants to be the best. And do they mock you for being good? Yes? Not really. Well, that's a good school then. When, in our school, when you want to be serious and you study hard and you have good grades, you always want to hide because the others were all a bit wor- uh, Worse than you, and they want to mock you because you are rising and they want to pull you down. Even in Scandinavian countries, nobody wants nobody to rise. And when one rises, they want to pull him down because we have to all be the same. No, we don't have to all be the same. You are unique. If you have a gift, if you have a talent, you can use that, and, but use it for the glory of God. Not to show off. Amen? If you're good at football, win it for the team, express it for the team. Of course, when the others are jealous, they will try to kick you in the leg to knock you out. Is that true? They are jealous. Are there bad people around? For sure. Never mind. Learn to beat them. Oh, why is he always playing the drums? I can also play the drums. And now you become jealous. He is good, but we give also other people the chance. Except for me, they don't give me a chance to play. It's okay. 
what you have, you have to use. But use it in a way that he glorifies God. Use it in a way that he promotes love. Use it in a way that it glorifies God and it helps to create an atmosphere. Amen? Good. I think I want to cut it a little bit short. I think I said what I wanted to say. Good works. Supernatural power. Divine love. And that point is so precious to my heart. When people see how we treat each other, that speaks. That speaks. So it's okay. Have fun. You know? Be respectful. Be conscious that people are observing you. Don't be scared. Don't be worried. You know? Just be you. And let's have a good time. People will notice. Because the, the young people that are here, they like to sit in the coffee. They smoke. And, you know, and they, they don't do much. But we are different. And we can show it. Not in an arrogant way. In a humble way. In a good way. We can show them there is a different way to do things. There is an alternative to what they think their, li their life is all about. Amen? And you have a chance to show that um, this week. We will give you the information. We're not going to kind of send you around door knocking and evangelizing and all the scary stuff, right? We want to have a natural way of evangelism, of a way to open people's hearts by who we are, what we do, and, you know, God willing, if we do EYC again here, we can build on that in the coming years. You know, if this is our only EYC, we're going to have a great breakthrough here. That's fine. If God wants us to continue, we're going to do that too. We see what the future holds. Okay? We have to just follow God. But above all, you must be a fragrance. You must spread that. And, and you know, when we had, a, we had an evangelist in, in our church building, it's just a, a few hundred meters away from here. And we had it in the garden. And we had the guitarist and the pianist. And they made the music so loud that, you know, people heard it around town, including the yoga class that is in this building on a Thursday. And the yoga class switched off their music and they started to listen to the worship music. And they really loved it. Because they could feel something. In Switzerland, next door, next door to one of our church buildings there, a new age lady moved in a couple of years ago to do her channeling. For fortune telling, you know, you know about that, right? With the crystal ball. This is not just, you know, some witch in a movie. This is, this is happening in Bulgaria also, also a lot. Fortune telling. People want to know the future. People want to know the supernatural. So this lady moved in next to the Christian Center in Romanshorn. And one of our ladies met her and said, Oh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm a fortune teller and I'm, I'm, I'm finding the channels, you know. You know, and this, this kind of new agey thing. And after two or three months, she moved out. And our lady asked her, what, why are you moving out to it? I said, oh, it's, it's not working here. <laughs> but the devil cannot operate where God is in charge. It's not possible. Darkness doesn't exist where there is light. It's a spiritual principle. So when we worship, when we pray, this is not just a fancy noise. This is not just funky music. This is spiritual warfare. And we need you to take all your bullets out that you brought with you from Slovenia, from Germany, from everywhere you come from, and shoot down as many demons as you can. Because the, the demonic works that it controls people's thinking and it influences people's thoughts. But we can clear the atmosphere this week and people suddenly have different types of thoughts, different types of influence. They see a different type of example, a different type of young person. Oh, they don't smoke. That's the first thing they will notice. I hope none of you smoke. You know? Oh, look at how happy they are. They're not depressed like our young people. Last Thursday, we, went, we met the elderly, the, the, the leadership of the elderly club here in town. We helped them a lot, the invalids as well. People are a little bit shy to receive help from the outside. So we are, we are gentle. We don't force our help on people. You know, the government is very happy that we come and help them. Because <laughs> they don't have enough money to keep everything clean. So it's okay, we help them. But we were sitting in this round, and there were only women and one man. Because most women here are widows, unfortunately, uh, the elderly. There was one man, and when he, when he heard that we want to go and help people chop their wood or clean their garden or do, just for, just for our intention, he stood up and said, you know what? 
I want to say something. And it's not easy for one man with, with, with 20 women to, get, to, to catch a moment to speak. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, I have four women at home. I mean, three are my daughters. Um, um, and he said, you know what? By you telling the young people to help the elderly, you are teaching them how to respect and honor the elderly people. I said, that is no longer existent in our, in our society. So that man was so impressed, he, he, he told us a whole poem. We sat there and he's, you know, he's a great orator. He can speak wonderfully in Bulgarian. And he it was a famous poetry that he quoted to us by heart. And totally, uh, you know, off guard. And this guy was so amazed that we would come here. And even the intention of us helping, even though we, we have not managed to, you know, um, people have not received our help as much as we wanted to. Because people are a little bit shy or they need a, a different type of help. It's okay. Just the fact that we want to do that. And even the TV is curious. That's why the TV didn't come yesterday when we invited them. They're coming tomorrow because they want to see that we are actually doing this. We're not just talking about it. We are doing it. And we're doing more community work than private help. But that's okay. It's a start. It's a beginning. We want to get more missionary teams to come and do this on a regular basis. So you're very welcome back. Even not as EYC, but you know, as missionaries. He was so impressed because not just for the work, but for what we want to teach you. Because you and I, we need to honor our parents. We need to honor the elderly. That is something that is lost in our society. And we can restore that and people will love us for it, especially the elderly.